Chapter 17 of The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T.R. Love. On the first day of the third week, Rose wrote to Frederick. In case she should again hesitate and not post the letter, she gave it to Domenico to post. For if she did not write now, there would be no time left at all. Half the month at San Salvatore was over. Even if Frederick started directly he got the letter, which, of course, he wouldn't be able to do, what with packing and passport, besides not being in a hurry to come, he couldn't arrive for five days. Having done it, Rose wished she hadn't. He wouldn't come. He wouldn't bother to answer. And if he did answer, it would just be giving some reason which was not true, and about being too busy to get away, and all that had been got by writing to him would be that she would be more unhappy than before. What things one did when one was idle! This resurrection of Frederick, or rather this attempt to resurrect him, what was it but the result of having nothing whatever to do? She wished she had never come away on holiday. What did she want with holidays? Work was her salvation. Work was the only thing that protected one, that kept one steady and one's values true. At home in Hampstead, absorbed and busy, she had managed to get over Frederick, thinking of him later lay only with the gentle melancholy with which one thinks of someone once loved but long since dead. And now this place, idleness in this soft place, had thrown her back to the wretched state she had climbed so carefully out of years ago. Why, if Frederick did come, she would only bore him. Hadn't she seen in a flash quite soon after getting to San Salvatore that that was really what kept him away from her? And why should she suppose that now, after such a long estrangement, she would be able not to bore him, be able to do anything but stand before him like a tongue-tied idiot with all the fingers of her spirit turned into thumbs? Besides, what a hopeless position to have, as it were, to beseech. Please wait a little. Please don't be impatient. I think perhaps I shan't be a bore presently. A thousand times a day Rose wished she had let Frederick alone. Lottie, who asked her every evening whether she had sent her letter yet, exclaimed with delight when the answer at last was yes, and threw her arms round her. Now we shall be completely happy cried the enthusiastic Lottie. But nothing seemed less certain to Rose, and her expression became more and more the expression of one who has something on her mind. Mr. Wilkins, wanting to find out what it was, strolled in the sun in his Panama hat and began to meet her accidentally. "'I did not know,' said Mr. Wilkins the first time, courteously raising his hat, that you too like this particular spot, and he sat down beside her. In the afternoon she chose another spot, and she had not been in it half an hour before Mr. Wilkins, lightly swinging his cane, came round the corner. We are destined to meet in our rambles, said Mr. Wilkins pleasantly, and he sat down beside her. Mr. Wilkins was very kind, and she had, she saw, misjudged him in Hampstead, and this was the real man, ripened like fruit by the beneficent son of San Salvatore. But Rose did want to be alone. Still, she was grateful to him for proving to her that though she might bore Frederick, she did not bore everybody. If she had, he would not have sat talking to her on each occasion till it was time to go in. True, he bored her, but that wasn't anything like so dreadful as if she bored him. Then, indeed, her vanity would have been sadly ruffled, for now that Rose was not able to say her prayers, she was being assailed by every sort of weakness, vanity, sensitiveness, irritability, pugnacity, strange, unfamiliar devils to have coming 
crowding on one and taking possession of one's swept and empty heart. She had never been vain or irritable or pugnacious in her life before. Could it be that San Salvatore was capable of opposite effects, and the same sun that ripened Mr. Wilkins made her go acid? The next morning, so as to be sure of being alone, she went down while Mr. Wilkins was still lingering pleasantly with Mrs. Fisher over breakfast to the rocks by the water's edge where she and Lottie had sat that first day. Frederick, by now, had got her letter. Today, if he were like Mr. Wilkins, she might get a telegram from him. She tried to silence the absurd hope by jeering at it. Yet, if Mr. Wilkins had telegraphed, why not Frederick? The spell of San Salvatore lurked, even, it seemed, in notepaper. Lottie had not dreamed of getting a telegram, and when she came in at lunchtime, there it was. It would be too wonderful if when she went back at lunchtime, she found one there for her, too. Rose clasped her hands tight round her knees. How passionately she longed to be important to somebody again, not important on platforms, not important as an asset in an organization, but privately important just to one other person, quite privately, nobody else to know or notice. It didn't seem much to ask in a world so crowded with people just to have one of them, only one out of all the millions, to oneself, somebody who needed one, who thought of one, who was eager to come to one. Oh, oh, how dreadfully one wanted to be precious. All the morning she sat beneath the pine tree by the sea. Nobody came near her. The great hours passed slowly. They seemed enormous. But she wouldn't go up before lunch. She would give the telegram time to arrive. That day, Scrap, egged on by Lottie's persuasions, and also thinking that perhaps she had sat long enough, had arisen from her chair and cushions, and gone off with Lottie and sandwiches up into the hills till evening. Mr. Wilkins, who wished to go with them, stayed, on Lady Caroline's advice, with Mrs. Fisher in order to cheer her solitude and though he left off cheering her about eleven to go and look for Mrs. Arbuthnot, so as for a space to cheer her too, thus dividing himself impartially between these solitary ladies, he came back again, presently mopping his forehead, and continued with Mrs. Fisher where he had left off, for this time Mrs. Arbuthnot had hidden successfully. There was a telegram, too, for her, he noticed when he came in, Pity he did not know where she was. Ought we to open it? he said to Mrs. Fisher. No, said Mrs. Fisher. It may require an answer. I don't approve of tampering with other people's correspondence. Tampering, my dear lady? Mr. Wilkins was shocked. Such a word, tampering. He had the greatest possible esteem for Mrs. Fisher, but he did at times find her a little difficult. She liked him, he was sure, and she was in a fair way, he felt, to become a client, but he feared she would be a headstrong and secretive client. She was certainly secretive, for though he had been skillful and sympathetic for a whole week, she had as yet given him no inkling of what was so evidently worrying her. Poor old thing, said Lottie, on his asking her if she perhaps could throw light on Mrs. Fisher's troubles. She hasn't got love. Love? Mr. Wilkins could only echo, genuinely scandalized. But surely, my dear, at her age. Any love, said Lottie. That very morning he had asked his wife, for he now sought and respected her opinion, if she could tell him what was the matter with Mrs. Arbuthnot, for she too though he had done his best to thaw her into confidence, had remained persistently retiring. She wants her husband, said Lottie. Ah, said Mr. Wilkins, a new light shed on Mrs. Arbuthnot's shy and modest melancholy, and he added, very proper. 
And Lottie said, smiling at him, One does. And Mr. Wilkins said, smiling at her, Does one? And Lottie said, smiling at him, Of course. And Mr. Wilkins, much pleased with her, though it was still quite early in the day, a time when caresses are sluggish, pinched her ear. Just before half-past twelve, Rose came slowly up through the pergola and between the camellias ranged on either side of the old stone steps. The rivulets of periwinkles that flowed down them when first she arrived were gone, and now there were these bushes, incredibly rosetted, pink, white, red, striped. She fingered and smelt them one after the other so as not to get to her disappointment too quickly. As long as she hadn't seen for herself, seen the table in the hall quite empty except for its bowl of flowers, she still could hope. She still could have the joy of imagining the telegram lying on it, waiting for her. But there was no smell in a camellia, as Mr. Wilkins, who was standing in the doorway on the lookout for her and knew what was necessary in horticulture, reminded her. She started at his voice and looked up. A telegram has come for you, said Mr. Wilkins. She stared at him, her mouth open. I searched for you everywhere, but failed. Of course, she knew it. She had been sure of it all the time. Bright and burning youth in that instant flashed down again on Rose. She flew up the steps, red as the camellia she had just been fingering, and was in the hall and tearing open the telegram before Mr. Wilkins had finished his sentence. Why, but if things could happen like this, why, but there was no end to, why, she and Frederick, they were going to be again at last. No bad news, I trust, said Mr. Wilkins, who had followed her, for when she had read the telegram, she stood staring at it, and her face went slowly white. Curious to watch how her face went slowly white. She turned and looked at Mr. Wilkins as if trying to remember him. Oh, no, on the contrary. She managed to smile. I'm going to have a visitor, she said, holding out the telegram, and when he had taken it, she walked away towards the dining room, murmuring something about lunch being ready. Mr. Wilkins read the telegram. It had been sent that morning from Mazago and was, Am passing through on way to Rome. May I pay my respects this afternoon? Thomas Briggs. Why should such a telegram make the interesting lady turn pale? for her pallor on reading it had been so striking as to convince Mr. Wilkins she was receiving a blow. Who is Thomas Briggs? he asked, following her into the dining room. She looked at him vaguely. Who, who is, she repeated, getting her thoughts together again. Thomas Briggs. Oh, yes, he is the owner. This is his house. He is very nice. He is coming this afternoon. Thomas Briggs was at that very moment coming. He was jogging along the road between Mazago and Castaneda in a fly, sincerely hoping that the dark-eyed lady would grasp that all he wanted was to see her, and not at all to see if his house were still there. He felt that an owner of delicacy did not intrude on a tenant. But he had been thinking so much of her since that day. Rose are Buthnot, such a pretty name, and such a pretty creature, mild, milky, mothery in the best sense, the best sense being that she wasn't his mother, and couldn't have been if she had tried, for parents were the only things impossible to have younger than oneself. Also, he was passing so near, it seemed absurd not just to look in and see if she were comfortable. He longed to see her in his house. He longed to see it as her background, to see her sitting in his chairs, drinking out of his cups, using all his things. Did she put the big crimson brocade cushion in the drawing room behind her little dark head? Her hair and the whiteness of her skin would look lovely against it. Had she seen the portrait of herself on the stairs? 
He wondered if she liked it. He would explain it to her. If she didn't paint, and she had said nothing to suggest it, she wouldn't perhaps notice how exactly the molding of the eyebrows and the slight hollow of the cheek. He told the fly to wait in Castaneto and crossed the piazza, hailed by children and dogs who all knew him and sprang up suddenly from nowhere and walking quickly up the zigzag path, for he was an active young man, not much more than thirty. He pulled the ancient chain that rang the bell and waited decorously on the proper side of the open door to be allowed to come in. At the sight of him, Francesca flung up every bit of her that would fling up, eyebrows, eyelids, and hands, and volubly assured him that all was in perfect order and that she was doing her duty. Of course, of course, said Briggs, cutting her short. No one doubts it. And he asked her to take in his card to her mistress. Which mistress? asked Francesca. Which mistress? There are four, said Francesca, scenting an irregularity on the part of the tenants, for her master looked surprised, and she felt pleased, for life was dull, and irregularities helped it along at least a little. Four, he repeated surprised. Well, take it to the lot, then, he said, recovering himself, for he noticed her expression. Coffee was being drunk in the top garden in the shade of the umbrella pine. Only Mrs. Fisher and Mr. Wilkins were drinking it, for Mrs. Arbuthnot, after eating nothing and being completely silent during lunch, had disappeared immediately afterwards. While Francesca went away into the garden with his card, her master stood examining the picture on the staircase of that Madonna by an early Italian painter, name unknown, picked up by him at Orvieto, who was so much like his tenant. It really was remarkable, the likeness. Of course, his tenant that day in London had had her hat on, but he was pretty sure her hair grew just like that off her forehead. The expression of the eyes, grave and sweet, was exactly the same. He rejoiced to think that he would always have her portrait. He looked up at the sound of footsteps, and there she was, coming down the stairs just as he had imagined her in that place, dressed in white. She was astonished to see him so soon. She had supposed he would come about tea time, and till then she had meant to sit somewhere out of doors where she could be by herself. He watched her coming down the stairs with the utmost eager interest. In a moment, she would be level with her portrait. It really is extraordinary, said Briggs. How do you do, said Rose, intent only on a decent show of welcome. She did not welcome him. He was here, she felt, the telegram bitter in her heart, instead of Frederick, doing what she had longed Frederick would do, taking his place. Just stand still a moment. She obeyed automatically. Yes, quite astonishing. Do you mind taking off your hat? Rose, surprised, took it off obediently. Yes, I thought so. I just wanted to make sure. And look, have you noticed? He began to make odd, swift passes with his hand over the face in the picture, measuring it, looking from it to her. Rose's surprise became amusement, and she could not help smiling. Have you come to compare me with my original? she asked. You do see how extraordinarily alike. I didn't know I looked so solemn. You don't, not now. You did a minute ago, quite as solemn. Oh, yes, how do you do? He finished suddenly, noticing her outstretched hand and he laughed and shook it, flushing a trick of his to the root of his hair. Francesca came back. The Signora Fisher, she said, will be pleased to see him. Who is the Signora Fisher? he asked Rose. One of the four who are sharing your house. Then there are four of you? Yes, 
My friend and I found we couldn't afford it by ourselves. Oh, I say, said Briggs in confusion, for he would best have liked Rose Arbuthnot, pretty name, not to have to afford anything, but to stay at San Salvatore as long as she liked as his guest. Mrs. Fisher is having coffee in the top garden, said Rose. I'll take you to her and introduce you. I don't want to go. You've got your hat on, so you were going for a walk. Mayn't I come too? I'd immensely like being shown round by you. But Mrs. Fisher is waiting for you. Won't she keep? Yes, said Rose with the smile that had so much attracted him the first day. I think she will keep quite well till tea. Do you speak Italian? No, said Rose. Why? On that he turned to Francesca and told her at a great rate, for in Italian he was glib, to go back to the signora in the top garden and tell her he had encountered his old friend the signora Arbuthnot and was going for a walk with her and would present himself to her later. Do you invite me to tea? he asked Rose when Francesca had gone. Of course, it's your house. It isn't. It's yours. Till Monday week, she smiled. Come and show me all the views, he said eagerly, and it was plain, even to the self-depreciatory Rose, that she did not bore Mr. Briggs. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T.R. Love. They had a very pleasant walk, with a great deal of sitting down in warm, time fragrant corners, and if anything could have helped Rose to recover from the bitter disappointment of the morning, it would have been the company and conversation of Mr. Briggs. He did help her to recover, and the same process took place as that which Lottie had undergone with her husband, and the more Mr. Briggs thought Rose charming, the more charming she became. Briggs was a man incapable of concealments, who never lost time if he could help it. They had not got to the end of the headland where the lighthouse is, Briggs had asked her to show him the lighthouse, because the path to it, he knew, was wide enough for two to walk abreast and fairly level, before he had told her of the impression she made on him in London. Since even the most religious sober women like to know they have made an impression, particularly the kind that has nothing to do with character or merits, Rose was pleased. Being pleased, she smiled. Smiling, she was more attractive than ever. Color came into her cheeks and brightness into her eyes. She heard herself saying things that really sounded quite interesting and even amusing. If Frederick were listening now, she thought, perhaps he would see that she couldn't, after all, be such a hopeless bore. For here was a man, nice-looking, young, and surely clever. He seemed clever, and she hoped he was, for then the compliment would be still greater, who was evidently quite happy to spend the afternoon just talking to her. And indeed, Mr. Briggs seemed very much interested. He wanted to hear all about everything she had been doing from the moment she got there. He asked her if she had seen this, that, and the other in the house, what she liked best, which room she had, if she were comfortable, if Francesca was behaving, if Domenico took care of her, and whether she didn't enjoy using the yellow sitting room, the one that got all the sun and looked out towards Genoa. Rose was ashamed how little she had noticed in the house, and how few of the things he spoke of as curious or beautiful in it she had even seen. Swamped in thought of Frederick, she appeared to have lived in San Salvatore blindly, and more than half the time had gone, and what had been the good of it? 
She might just as well have been sitting hankering on Hampstead Heath. No, she mightn't. Through all her hankerings, she had been conscious that she was at least in the very heart of beauty. And indeed, it was this beauty, this longing to share it, that had first started her off, hankering. Mr. Briggs, however, was too much alive for her to be able to spare any attention at this moment for Frederick, and she praised the servants in answer to his questions, and praised the yellow sitting-room without telling him she had only been in it once, and then was ignominiously ejected, and she told him she knew hardly anything about art and curiosities, but thought perhaps if somebody would tell her about them she would know more and she said she had spent every day since her arrival out of doors because out of doors there was so very wonderful and different from anything she had ever seen briggs walked by her side along his paths that were yet so happily for the moment her paths and felt all the innocent glows of family life. He was an orphan and an only child, and had a warm domestic disposition. He would have adored a sister and spoiled a mother, and was beginning at this time to think of marrying. For though he had been very happy with his various loves, each of whom, contrary to the usual experience, turned ultimately into his devoted friend, he was fond of children, and thought he had perhaps now got to the age of settling, if he did not wish to be too old by the time his oldest son was twenty. San Salvatore had laterly seemed a little forlorn. He fancied it echoed when he walked about it. He had felt lonely there, so lonely that he had preferred this year to miss out a spring and let it. It wanted a wife in it. It wanted that final touch of warmth and beauty, for he never thought of his wife except in terms of warmth and beauty. She would, of course, be beautiful and kind. It amused him how much in love with this vague wife he was already. At such a rate, he was making friends with the lady with the sweet name as he walked along the path toward the lighthouse that he was sure presently he would be telling her everything about himself and his past doings and his future hopes, and the thought of such a swiftly developing confidence made him laugh. Why are you laughing? she asked, looking at him and smiling. It's so like coming home, he said. But it is coming home for you to come here. I mean really like coming home to one's one's family. I never had a family. I'm an orphan. Oh, are you, said Rose, with the proper sympathy. I hope you've not been one very long. No, I don't mean I hope you have been one very long. No, I don't know what I mean, except that I'm sorry. He laughed again. Oh, I'm used to it. I haven't anybody, no sisters or brothers. Then you're an only child, she observed intelligently. Yes, and there's something about you that's exactly my idea of a, of a family. She was amused. So cozy, he said, looking at her and searching for a word. You wouldn't think so if you saw my house in Hampstead, she said, a vision of that austere and hard-seated dwelling presenting itself to her mind with nothing soft in it except the shunned and neglected Dubarry sofa. No wonder, she thought for a moment clear-brained, that Frederick avoided it. There was nothing cozy about his family. I don't believe any place you lived in could be anything but exactly like you, he said. You're not going to pretend San Salvatore is like me. Indeed, I do pretend it. Surely you admit that it is beautiful. He said several things like that. She enjoyed her walk. She could not recollect any walk so pleasant since her courting days. She came back to tea, bringing Mr. Briggs, and looking quite different, Mr. Wilkins noticed, from what she had looked till then. Trouble here, trouble here, 
thought Mr. Wilkins, mentally rubbing his professional hands. He could see himself being called in presently to advise. On the one hand, there was Arbuthnot. On the other hand, here was Briggs. Trouble brewing, trouble sooner or later. But why had Briggs's telegram acted on the lady like a blow? If she turned pale from excess of joy, then trouble was nearer than he had supposed. She was not pale now. She was more like her name than he had yet seen her. Well, he was the man for trouble. He regretted, of course, that people should get into it, but being in, he was their man. And Mr. Wilkins, invigorated by these thoughts, his career being very precious to him, proceeded to assist in doing the honors to Mr. Briggs, both in his quality of sharer in the temporary ownership of San Salvatore and of probable helper out of difficulties. With great hospitality, and pointed out the various features of the place to him, and led him to the parapet, and showed him Mazago across the bay. Mrs. Fisher, too, was gracious. This was this young man's house. He was a man of property. She liked property, and she liked men of property. Also, there seemed to be a peculiar merit in being a man of property so young. Inheritance, of course. An inheritance was more respectable than acquisition. It did indicate fathers, and in an age where most people appeared neither to have them nor to want them, she liked this too. Accordingly, it was a pleasant meal, with everybody amiable and pleased. Briggs thought Mrs. Fisher a dear old lady, and showed he thought so, and again the magic worked, and she became a dear old lady. She developed benignity with him, a kind of benignity which was almost playful, actually before tea was over, including in some observation she made him the words, My dear boy! Strange words in Mrs. Fisher's mouth. It is doubtful whether in her life she had used them before. Rose was astonished how nice people really were. When would she leave off making mistakes about them? She hadn't suspected this side of Mrs. Fisher, and she began to wonder whether those other sides of her with which alone she was acquainted had not perhaps, after all, been the effect of her own militant and irritating behavior. Probably they were. How horrid, then, she must have been. She felt very penitent when she saw Mrs. Fisher beneath her eyes, blossoming into real amiability the moment someone came along who was charming to her. And she could have sunk into the ground with shame when Mrs. Fisher presently laughed, and she realized by the shock it gave her that the sound was entirely new. Not once before had she or anyone else there heard Mrs. Fisher laugh. What an indictment of the lot of them! for they had all laughed, the others, some more, some less, at one time or another since their arrival, and only Mrs. Fisher had not. Clearly, since she could enjoy herself as she was now enjoying herself, she had not enjoyed herself before. Nobody had cared whether she did or not, except perhaps Lottie. Yes, Lottie had cared, and had wanted her to be happy. But Lottie seemed to produce a bad effect on Mrs. Fisher, while as for Rose herself, she had never been with her for five minutes without wanting, really wanting, to provoke and oppose her. How very horrid she had been. She had behaved unpardonably. Her penitence showed itself in a shy and deferential solicitude toward Mrs. Fisher, which made the observant Briggs think her still more angelic and wish for a moment that he were an old lady himself in order to be behaved to by Rose Arbuthnot just like that. There was evidently no end, he thought, to the thing she could do sweetly. He would not even mind taking medicine, really nasty medicine, if it were Rose Arbuthnot bending over him with the dose. She felt his bright blue eyes, the brighter because he was so sunburnt, 
fixed on her with a twinkle in them, and smiling, asked him what he was thinking about. But he couldn't very well tell her that, he said, and added, some day. Trouble, trouble, thought Mr. Wilkins at this, again mentally rubbing his hands. Well, I'm their man. I'm sure, said Mrs. Fisher benignly, you have no thoughts we may not hear. I'm sure, said Briggs, I would be telling you every one of my secrets in a week. You would be telling somebody very safe, then, said Mrs. Fisher benevolently. Just such a son she would have liked to have had. And in return, she went on, I dare say I would tell you mine. Ah, oh, no, said Mr. Wilkins, adapting himself to this tone of easy badinage. I must protest. I really must. I have a prior claim. I am the older friend. I have known Mrs. Fisher ten days, and you, Briggs, have not yet known her one. I assert my right to be told her secrets first. That is, he added, bowing gallantly, if she has any, which I beg leave to doubt. Oh, haven't I? exclaimed Mrs. Fisher, thinking of those green leaves. That she should exclaim at all was surprising, but that she should do it with gaiety was miraculous. Rose could only watch her in wonder. Then I shall warm them out, said Briggs with equal gaiety. They won't need much warming out, said Mrs. Fisher. My difficulty is to keep them from bursting out. It might have been Lottie talking. Mr. Wilkins adjusted the single eyeglass he carried with him for occasions like this and examined Mrs. Fisher carefully. Rose looked on, unable not to smile, too, since Mrs. Fisher seemed so much amused, though Rose did not quite know why, and her smile was a little uncertain, for Mrs. Fisher amused was a new sight, not without its awe-inspiring aspects, and had to be got accustomed to. What Mrs. Fisher was thinking was how much surprised they would be if she told them of her very odd and exciting sensation of going to come out all over buds. They would think she was an extremely silly old woman, and so would she have thought as lately as two days ago, but the bud idea was becoming familiar to her. She was more apprivoisé now, as dear Matthew Arnold used to say, and though it would undoubtedly be best if one's appearance and sensations matched, yet supposing they did not, and one couldn't have everything, was it not better to feel young somewhere rather than old everywhere? Time enough to be old everywhere again, inside as well as out, when she got back to her sarcophagus in Prince of Wales Terrace. Yet it is probable that without the arrival of Mr. Briggs, Mrs. Fisher would have gone on secretly fermenting in her shell. The others only knew her as severe, it would have been more than her dignity could bear suddenly to relax, especially towards the three young women. But now came the stranger, Briggs, a stranger who at once took to her as no young man had taken to her in her life, and it was the coming of Briggs and his real and manifest appreciation for such a grandmother, thought Briggs, hungry for home life and its concomitants, would he have liked to have that released Mrs. Fisher from her shell, and here she was at last, as Lottie had predicted, pleased, good-humoured, and benevolent. Lottie, coming back half an hour later from her picnic, and following the sound of voices into the top garden in hope of still finding tea, saw at once what had happened, for Mrs. Fisher at that very moment was laughing. She's burst her cocoon, thought Lottie, and swift as she was in all her movements, and impulsive, and also without any sense of propriety to worry and delay her, she bent over the back of Mrs. Fisher's chair and kissed her. Good gracious, cried Mrs. Fisher, starting violently, for such a thing had not happened to her since Mr. Fisher's earlier days, and then only gingerly. 
This kiss was a real kiss and rested on Mrs. Fisher's cheek a moment with a strange, soft sweetness. When she saw whose it was, a deep flush spread over her face. Mrs. Wilkins kissing her and the kiss feeling so affectionate. Even if she wanted to, she could not, in the presence of the appreciative Mr. Briggs, resume her cast-off severity and begin rebuking again. But she did not want to. Was it possible Mrs. Wilkins liked her? Had liked her all this time while she had been so much disliking her herself? A queer little trickle of warmth filtered through the frozen defenses of Mrs. Fisher's heart. Somebody young kissing her, somebody young wanting to kiss her. Very much flushed, she watched the strange creature, apparently quite unconscious she had done anything extraordinary, shaking hands with Mr. Briggs on her husband's introducing him, and immediately embarking on the friendliest conversation with him, exactly as if she had known him all her life. What a strange creature, what a very strange creature. It was natural, she being so strange, that one should have, perhaps, misjudged her. I'm sure you want some tea, said Briggs, with eager hospitality to Lottie. He thought her delightful, freckles, picnic untidiness and all, just such a sister would he. This is cold, he said, feeling the teapot. I'll tell Francesca to make you some fresh. He broke off and blushed. <gasps> Aren't I forgetting myself, he said, laughing and looking round at them. Very natural, very natural, Mr. Wilkins reassured him. I'll go and tell Francesca, said Rose, getting up. No, no, said Briggs, don't go away. And he put his hands to his mouth and shouted. Francesca, shouted Briggs. She came running. No summons in their experience had been answered by her with such celerity. Her master's voice, remarked Mr. Wilkins, aptly, he considered. Make fresh tea, ordered Briggs in Italian. Quick, quick. And then, remembering himself, he blushed again and begged everybody's pardon. Very natural, very natural, Mr. Wilkins reassured him. Briggs then explained to Lottie what he had explained twice already, once to Rose and once to the other two, that he was on his way to Rome and thought he would get out at Mazago and just look in to see if they were comfortable and continue his journey the next day, staying the night in a hotel at Mazago. But how ridiculous, said Lottie. Of course you must stay here. It's your house. There's Kate Lumley's room, she added, turning to Mrs. Fisher, you wouldn't mind Mr. Briggs having it for one night. Kate Lumley isn't in it, you know, she said, turning to Briggs again and laughing. And Mrs. Fisher, to her immense surprise, laughed too. She knew that any other time this remark would have struck her as excessively unseemly, and yet now she only thought it funny. No, indeed, she assured Briggs, Kate Lumley was not in that room. Very fortunately, for she was an excessively wide person, and the room was excessively narrow. Kate Lumley might get into it, but that was about all. Once in, she would fit it so tightly that probably she would never be able to get out again. It was entirely at Mr. Briggs's disposal, and she hoped he would do nothing so absurd as go to a hotel. He, the owner of the whole place. Rose listened to this speech wide-eyed with amazement. Mrs. Fisher laughed very much as she made it. Lottie laughed very much, too, and at the end of it bent down and kissed her again, kissed her several times. So you see, my dear boy, said Mrs. Fisher, you must stay here and give us all a great deal of pleasure. A great deal indeed, corroborated Mr. Wilkins heartily. A very great deal, repeated Mrs. Fisher, looking exactly like a pleased mother. Do, said Rose, on Briggs's turning inquiringly to her. How kind of you all, he said, his face broad with smiles. I'd love to be a guest here. What a new sensation, and with three such 
He broke off and looked round. I say, he asked, oughtn't I to have a fourth hostess? Francesca said she had four mistresses. Yes, there's Lady Caroline, said Lottie. Then hadn't we better find out first if she invites me to? Oh, but she's sure, began Lottie. The daughter of the droit witches, Briggs, said Mr. Wilkins, is not likely to be wanting in the proper hospitable impulses. The daughter of the, repeated Briggs, but he stopped dead, for there in the doorway was the daughter of the droit witches herself, or rather, coming towards him out of the dark doorway into the brightness of the sunset, was that which he had not in his life yet seen but only dreamed of, his ideal of absolute loveliness. End of chapter 18「Chapter Nineteen of the Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T. R. Love. And then, when she spoke, what chance was there for poor Briggs? He was undone. All Scrap said was, "How do you do?" On Mr. Wilkins presenting him, but it was enough. It undid Briggs from a cheerful, chatty, happy young man overflowing with life and friendliness, he became silent, solemn, and with little beads on his temples. Also, he became clumsy, dropping the teaspoon as he handed her her cup, mismanaging the macaroons so that one rolled on the ground. His eyes could not keep off the enchanting face for a moment, and when Mr. Wilkins, elucidating him, for he failed to elucidate himself, inform Lady Caroline that in Mr. Briggs she beheld the owner of San Salvatore, who was on his way to Rome, but had got out at Mazzago, etc., etc., and that the other three ladies had invited him to spend the night in what was, to all intents and purposes, his own house, rather than a hotel, and Mr. Briggs was only waiting for the seal of her approval to this invitation, she being the fourth hostess. When Mr. Wilkins, balancing his sentences and being admirably clear and enjoying the sound of his own cultured voice, explained the position in this manner to Lady Caroline, Briggs sat and never said a word. A deep melancholy invaded Scrap. The symptoms of the incipient grabber were all there and only too familiar, and she knew that if Briggs stayed, her rest cure might be regarded as over. Then Kate Lumley occurred to her. She caught at Kate as at a straw. It would have been delightful, she said, faintly smiling at Briggs. She could not, in decency, not smile at least a little but even a little betrayed the dimple, and Briggs' eyes became more fixed than ever. I'm wondering if there is room. Yes, there is, said Lottie. There's Kate Lumley's room. I thought, said Scrap to Mrs. Fisher, and it seemed to Briggs that he had never heard music till now. Your friend was expected immediately. Oh, no, said Mrs. Fisher, with an odd placidness, Scrap thought. Miss Lumley, said Mr. Wilkins, or should I, he inquired of Mrs. Fisher, say, Mrs. Nobody has ever married Kate, said Mrs. Fisher, complacently. Quite so. Miss Lumley does not arrive today, in any case, Lady Caroline, and Mr. Briggs has, unfortunately, if I may say so, to continue his journey to-morrow, so that his staying would in no way interfere with Miss Lumley's possible movements. Then, of course, I join in the invitation, said Scrap, with what was to Briggs the most divine cordiality. He stammered something, flushing scarlet, and Scrap thought, oh, and turned her head away. But that merely made Briggs acquainted with her profile. And if there existed anything more lovely than Scrap's full face, it was her profile. Well, it was only for this one afternoon and evening, 
Hugh would leave, no doubt, the first thing in the morning. It took hours to get to Rome. Awful if he hung on till the night train. She had a feeling that the principal express to Rome passed through at night. Why hadn't that woman Kate Lumley arrived yet? She had forgotten all about her, but now she remembered she was to have been invited a fortnight ago. What had become of her? This man, once let in, would come and see her in London, would haunt the places she was likely to go. He had the makings, her experienced eye could see, of a passionately persistent grabber. If, thought Mr. Wilkins, observing Briggs's face and sudden silence, any understanding existed between this young fellow and Mrs. Arbuthnot, there is now going to be trouble trouble of a different nature from the kind I feared, in which Arbuthnot would have played a leading part, in fact, the part of petitioner, but trouble that may need help and advice none the less, for it's not being publicly scandalous. Briggs, impelled by his passions and her beauty, will aspire to the daughter of the droit witches. She, naturally and properly, will repel him. Mrs. Arbuthnot, left in the cold, will be upset and show it. Arbuthnot, on his arrival, will find his wife in enigmatic tears. Inquiring into their cause, he will be met with an icy reserve. More trouble may then be expected, and in me they will seek and find their adviser. When Lottie said Mrs. Arbuthnot wanted her husband, she was wrong. What Mrs. Arbuthnot wants is Briggs, and it looks uncommonly as if she were not going to get him. Well, I'm their man. Where are your things, Mr. Briggs? asked Mrs. Fisher, her voice round with motherliness. Oughtn't they to be fetched? For the sun was nearly in the sea now, and the sweet-smelling April dampness that followed immediately on its disappearance was beginning to steal into the garden. Briggs started. My things? he repeated. Oh, yes, I must fetch them. They're in Mazago. I'll send Domenico. My fly is waiting in the village. He can go back in it. I'll go and tell him. He got up. To whom was he talking? To Mrs. Fisher, ostensibly. Yet his eyes were fixed on Scrap, who said nothing and looked at no one. Then, recollecting himself, he stammered, I'm awfully sorry. I keep on forgetting. I'll go down and fetch them myself. We can always send Domenico, said Rose, and at her gentle voice he turned his head. Why, there was his friend, the sweet-named lady, but how had she not in this short interval changed? Was it the failing light making her so colorless, so vague-featured, so dim, so much like a ghost? A nice, good ghost, of course, and still with a pretty name, but only a ghost. He turned from her to scrap again, and forgot Rose Arbuthnot's existence. How was it possible for him to bother about anybody or anything else in this first moment of being face to face with his dream come true. Briggs had not supposed or hoped that anyone as beautiful as his dream of beauty existed. He had never till now met even an approximation. Pretty women, charming women by the score he had met and properly appreciated, but never the real, the godlike thing itself. He used to think, if I ever saw a perfectly beautiful woman, I should die. And though, having now met to what his ideas was a perfectly beautiful woman, he did not die. He became very nearly as incapable of managing his own affairs as if he had. The others were obliged to arrange everything for him. By questions, they extracted from him that his luggage was in the station cloakroom at Mazago, and they sent for Domenico, and urged and prompted by everybody except Scrap, who sat in silence and looked at no one. Briggs was induced to give him the necessary instructions for going back in the fly and bringing out his things. 
It was a sad sight to see the collapse of Briggs. Everybody noticed it, even Rose. Upon my word, thought Mrs. Fisher, the way one pretty face can turn a delightful man into an idiot is past all patience. And feeling the air getting chilly and the sight of the enthralled Briggs painful, she went in to order his room to be got ready, regretting now that she had pressed the poor boy to stay. She had forgotten Lady Caroline's killjoy face for the moment, and the more completely, owing to the absence of any ill effects produced by it on Mr. Wilkins. Poor boy! Such a charming boy, too, left to himself. It was true she could not accuse Lady Caroline of not leaving him to himself, for she was taking no notice of him at all, but that did not help. Exactly like foolish moths did men, in other respects intelligent, flutter round the impassive lighted candle of a pretty face. She had seen them doing it. She had looked on only too often. Almost she laid a mother hand on Briggs's fair head as she passed him. Poor boy! Then Scrap, having finished her cigarette, got up and went indoors too. She saw no reason why she should sit there in order to gratify Mr. Briggs's desire to stare. She would have liked to stay out longer, to go to her corner behind the Daphne bushes and look at the sunset sky and watch the lights coming out one by one in the village below and smell the sweet moistness of the evening. But if she did, Mr. Briggs would certainly follow her. The old familiar tyranny had begun again. Her holiday of peace and liberation was interrupted, perhaps over, for who knew if he would go away after all tomorrow? He might leave the house, driven out of it by Kate Lumley, but that was nothing to prevent his taking rooms in the village and coming up every day. This tyranny of one person over another, and she was so miserably constructed that she wouldn't even be able to frown him down without being misunderstood. Scrap, who loved this time of the evening in her corner, felt indignant with Mr. Briggs, who was doing her out of it, and she turned her back on the garden and him and went towards the house without a look or a word. But Briggs, when he realized her intention, leapt to his feet, snatched chairs which were not in her way out of it, kicked a footstool which was not in her path on one side, hurried to the door which stood wide open, in order to hold it open, and followed her through it, walking by her side along the hall. What was to be done with Mr. Briggs? Well, it was his hall. She couldn't prevent his walking along it. I hope, he said, not able while walking to take his eyes off her, so that he knocked against several things he would otherwise have avoided, the corner of a bookcase, an ancient carved cupboard, the table with flowers on it, shaking the water over, that you are quite comfortable here? If you're not, I'll, I'll flay them alive. His voice vibrated. What was to be done with Mr. Briggs? She could, of course, stay in her room the whole time, say she was ill, not appear at dinner, but again, the tyranny of this. I'm very comfortable indeed, said Scrap. If I had dreamed you were coming, he began. It's a wonderful old place, said Scrap, doing her utmost to sound detached and forbidding, but with little hope of success. The kitchen was on this floor, and passing its door, which was open a crack, they were observed by the servants, whose thoughts, communicated to each other by looks, may be roughly reproduced by such rude symbols as Aha! and oh ho! Symbols which represented and included their appreciation of the inevitable, their foreknowledge of the inevitable, and their complete understanding and approval. Are you going upstairs? asked Briggs as she paused at the foot of them. Yes. Which room do you sit in? The drawing room or the small yellow room? In my own room, 
So then he couldn't go up with her. So then all he could do was to wait till she came out again. He longed to ask her which was her own room. It thrilled him to hear her call any room in his house her own room, that he might picture her in it. He longed to know if by any happy chance it was his room, forever after to be filled with her wonder, but he didn't dare. He would find out later from someone else, Francesca, anybody. Then I shan't see you again till dinner. Dinner is at eight, was Scrap's evasive answer as she went upstairs. He watched her go. She passed the Madonna, the portrait of Rose Arbuthnot, and the dark-eyed figure he had thought so sweet seemed to turn pale, to shrivel into insignificance as she passed. She turned the bend off the stairs, and the setting sun, shining through the west window a moment on her face, turned her to glory. She disappeared, and the sun went out, too, and the stairs were dark and empty. He listened till her footsteps were silent, trying to tell from the sound of the shutting door which room she had gone into, then wandered aimlessly away through the hall again and found himself back in the top garden. Scrap, from her window, saw him there. She saw Lottie and Rose sitting on the end parapet where she would have liked to have been, and she saw Mr. Wilkins buttonholing Briggs and evidently telling him the story of the oleander tree in the middle of the garden. Briggs was listening with a patience she thought rather nice, seeing that it was his oleander and his own father's story. She knew Mr. Wilkins was telling him the story by his gestures. Domenico had told it her soon after her arrival, and he had also told Mrs. Fisher, who had told Mr. Wilkins. Mrs. Fisher thought highly of this story and often spoke of it. It was about a cherry wood walking stick. Briggs's father had thrust this stick into the ground at that spot and said to Domenico's father, who was then the gardener, here we will have an oleander. And Briggs's father left the stick in the ground as a reminder to Domenico's father. And presently, how long afterwards nobody remembered, the stick began to sprout, and it was an oleander. There stood poor Mr. Briggs being told all about it and listening to the story he must have known from infancy with patience. Probably he was thinking of something else. She was afraid he was. How unfortunate, how extremely unfortunate, the determination that sees people to get hold of and engulf other people. If only they could be induced to stand more on their own feet. Why couldn't Mr. Briggs be more like Lottie, who never wanted anything of anybody, but was complete in herself and respected other people's completeness? One loved being with Lottie. With her, one was free and yet befriended. Mr. Briggs looked so really nice, too. She thought she might like him, if only he wouldn't so excessively like her. Scrap felt melancholy. Here she was, shut up in her bedroom, which was stuffy from the afternoon sun that had been pouring into it, instead of out in the cool garden, and all because of Mr. Briggs. Intolerably tyranny, she thought, flaring up. She wouldn't endure it. She would go out all the same. She would run downstairs while Mr. Wilkins, really that man was a treasure, held Mr. Briggs down telling him about the oleander, and get out of the house by the front door and take cover in the shadows of the zigzag path. Nobody could see her there, Nobody would think of looking for her there. She snatched up a wrap, for she did not mean to come back for a long while, perhaps not even to dinner. It would be all Mr. Briggs's fault if she went dinnerless and hungry. And with another glance out of the window to see if she were still safe, she stole out and got away to the sheltering trees of the zigzag path, and there sat down on one of the seats placed at each bend, to assist the upward journey of those who were breathless. Ah, oh, this was lovely, thought Scrap with a sigh of relief. How cool, how good it smelt. 
She could see the quiet water of the little harbor through the pine trunks and the lights coming out in the houses on the other side, and all round her the green dusk was splashed by the rose pink of the gladioluses in the grass and the white of the crowding daisies. Ah, this was lovely, so still, nothing moving, not a leaf, not a stalk. The only sound was a dog barking far away somewhere up in the hills, or when the door of the little restaurant in the piazza below was opened and there was a burst of voices, silenced again immediately by the swinging to of the door. She drew in a deep breath of pleasure. Ah, this was... Her deep breath was arrested in the middle. What was that? She leaned forward, listening, her body tense. Footsteps on the zigzag path. Briggs finding her out. Should she run? No. The footsteps were coming up, not down. Someone from the village, perhaps Angelo, with provisions. She relaxed again. But the steps were not the steps of Angelo, that swift and springy youth. They were slow and considered, and they kept on pausing. Someone who isn't used to hills thought Scrap. The idea of going back to the house did not occur to her. She was afraid of nothing in life except love. Brigands or murderers, as such, held no terrors for the daughter of the droit witches. She only would have been afraid of them if they left off being brigands and murderers and began instead to try and make love. The next moment the footsteps turned the corner of her bit of path and stood still. Getting his wind, thought Scrap, not looking round. Then, as he, from the sounds of the steps, she took them to belong to a man, did not move. She turned her head and beheld with astonishment a person she had seen a good deal of lately in London, the well-known writer of amusing memoirs, Mr. Ferdinand Arundel. She stared. Nothing in the way of being followed surprised her any more but that he should have discovered where she was surprised her. Her mother had promised faithfully to tell no one. You, she said, feeling betrayed. Here? He came up to her and took off his hat. His forehead beneath the hat was wet with the beads of unaccustomed climbing. He looked ashamed and entreating, like a guilty but devoted dog. You must forgive me, he said. Lady Droitwich told me where you were, and as I happened to be passing through my way to Rome, I thought I would get out at Mazago and just look in and see how you were. But didn't my mother tell you I was doing a rest cure? Yes, she did, and that's why I haven't intruded on you earlier in the day. I thought you would probably be asleep all day and wake up about now so as to be fed. But I know. I've got nothing to say in excuse. I couldn't help myself. This, thought Scrap, comes of mother insisting on having authors to lunch and me being so much more amiable in appearance than I really am. She had been amiable to Ferdinand Arundel. She liked him, or rather she did not dislike him. He seemed a jovial, simple man and had the eyes of a nice dog. Also, though it was evident that he admired her, he had not, in London, grabbed. There he had merely been a good-natured, harmless person of entertaining conversation, who helped to make luncheons agreeable. Now it appeared that he, too, was a grabber. Fancy following her out there. Daring, to. Nobody else had. Perhaps her mother had given him the address because she considered him so absolutely harmless and thought he might be useful to see her home. Well, whatever he was, he couldn't possibly give her the trouble an active man like Mr. Briggs might give her. Mr. Briggs, infatuated, would be reckless, she felt, would stick at nothing, would lose his head publicly. She could imagine Mr. Briggs doing things with rope ladders and singing all night under her window, being really difficult and uncomfortable. Mr. Arundel hadn't the figure for any kind of recklessness. 
He had lived too long and too well. She was sure he couldn't sing and wouldn't want to. He must be at least forty. How many good dinners could not a man have eaten by the time he was forty? And if during that time, instead of taking exercise, he had sat writing books, he would, quite naturally, acquire the figure Mr. Arundel had, in fact, acquired, the figure rather for conversation than adventure. Scrap, who had become melancholy at the side of Briggs, became philosophical at the side of Arundel. Here he was. She couldn't send him away till after dinner. He must be nourished. This being so, she had better make the best of it, and do that with a good grace which anyhow wasn't to be avoided. Besides, he would be a temporary shelter from Mr. Briggs. She was at least acquainted with Ferdinand Arundel, and could hear news from him of her mother and her friends. And such talk would put up a defensive barrier at dinner between herself and the approaches of the other one. And it was only for one dinner— and he couldn't eat her. She therefore prepared herself for friendliness. I'm to be fed, she said, ignoring his last remark, at eight, and you must come up and be fed too. Sit down and get cool, and tell me how everybody is. May I really dine with you in these traveling things, he said, wiping his forehead before sitting down beside her. She was too lovely to be true, he thought, just to look at her for an hour, just to hear her voice, was enough reward for his journey and his fears. Of course, I suppose you've left your fly in the village, and will be going on from Mazago by the night train? Or stay in Mazago at a hotel and go on tomorrow? But tell me, he said, gazing at the adorable profile, about yourself. London has been extraordinarily dull and empty. Lady Droywich said you were with people here she didn't know. I hope they've been kind to you. You look, well, as if your cure had done everything a cure should. They've been very kind, said Scrap. I got them out of an advertisement. An advertisement? It's a good way, I find, to get friends. I'm fonder of one of these than I've been of anybody in years. Really? Who is it? You shall guess which one of them it is when you see them. Tell me about Mother. When did you see her last? We arranged not to write to each other unless there was something special. I wanted to have a month that was perfectly blank. And now I've come and interrupted. I can't tell you how ashamed I am, both of having done it and of not having been able to help it. Oh, but, said Scrap quickly, for he could not have come on a better day, when up there waiting and watching for her was, she knew, the enamored Briggs. I'm really glad indeed to see you. Tell me about Mother. End of chapter 19「Twenty of the Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T. R. Love. Scrap wanted to know so much about her mother that Arundel had presently to invent. He would talk about anything she wished, if only he might be with her for a while and see her and hear her. But he knew very little of the droit witches and their friends, really beyond meeting them at those bigger functions where literature is also represented, and amusing them at lunches and dinners, he knew very little of them, really. To them he had always remained Mr. Arundel. No one called him Ferdinand, and he only knew the gossip also available to the evening papers and the frequenters of clubs. But he was, however, good at inventing, and as soon as he had come to an end of first-hand knowledge, in order to answer her inquiries and keep her there to himself, he proceeded to invent. It was quite easy to fasten some of the entertaining things he was constantly thinking on to other people and pretend they were theirs. Scrap, who had that affection for her parents which warms in absence, was a thirst for news, 
and became more and more interested by the news he gradually imparted. At first it was ordinary news. He had met her mother here and seen her there. She looked very well. She said so and so. But presently the things Lady Droitwich had said took on an unusual quality. They became amusing. Mother said that? Scrap interrupted, surprised, and presently Lady Droitwich began to do amusing things as well as say them. Mother did that? Scrap inquired, wide-eyed. Arundel warmed to his work. He fathered some of the most entertaining ideas he had lately had on to Lady Droitwich, and also any charming funny things that had been done or might have been done, for he could imagine almost anything. Scrap's eyes grew round with wonder and affectionate pride in her mother. Why, but how funny! Fancy mother! What an old darling! Did she really do that? How perfectly adorable of her! And did she really say, but how wonderful of her to think of it! What sort of a face did Lloyd George make? She laughed and laughed and had a great longing to hug her mother, and the time flew, and it grew quite dusk, and it grew nearly dark, and Mr. Arundel still went on amusing her, and it was a quarter to eight before she suddenly remembered dinner. Oh, good heavens, she exclaimed, jumping up. Yes, it's late, said Arundel. I'll go on quickly and send the maid to you. I must run or I'll never be ready in time. And she was gone up the path with the swiftness of a young slender deer. Arundel followed. He did not wish to arrive too hot, so had to go slowly. Fortunately, he was near the top, and Francesca came down the pergola to pilot him indoors, and having shown him where he could wash, she put him in the empty drawing-room to cool himself by the crackling wood fire. He got as far away from the fire as he could, and stood in one of the deep window recesses, looking out at the distant lights of Misago. The drawing-room door was open, and the house was quiet with the hush that precedes dinner, when the inhabitants are all shut up in their rooms dressing. Briggs, in his room, was throwing away spoilt tie after spoilt tie, Scrap, in hers, was hurrying into a black frock with a vague notion that Mr. Briggs wouldn't be able to see her so clearly in black. Mrs. Fisher was fastening the lace shawl, which nightly transformed her day dress into her evening dress, with the brooch Ruskin had given her on her marriage, formed of two pearl lilies tied together by a blue enamel ribbon, on which was written in gold letters, Esto Perpetua. Mr. Wilkins was sitting on the edge of his bed, brushing his wife's hair. Thus far in this third week he had progressed in demonstrativeness, while she, for her part, sitting on a chair in front of him, put his studs in a clean shirt. And Rose, ready dressed, sat at her window, considering her day. Rose was quite aware of what had happened to Mr. Briggs. If she had had any difficulty about it, Lottie would have removed it by the frank comments she made while she and Rose sat together after tea on the wall. Lottie was delighted at more love being introduced into San Salvatore, even if it were only one-sided, and said that when Rose's husband was there, she didn't suppose, now that Mrs. Fisher, too, had at last come unglued, Rose protested at the expression, and Lottie retorted that it was in Keats, there would be another place in the world more swarming with happiness than San Salvatore. Your husband, said Lottie, swinging her feet, might be here quite soon, perhaps tomorrow evening if he starts at once, and there'll be a glorious final few days before we all go home refreshed for life. I don't believe any of us will ever be the same again, and I wouldn't be a bit surprised if Caroline doesn't end up by getting fond of the young man Briggs. It's in the air. You have to get fond of people here. 
Rose sat at her window thinking of these things. Lottie's optimism, yet it had been justified by Mr. Wilkins, and looked, too, at Mrs. Fisher. If only it would come true as well about Frederick. For Rose, who between lunch and tea had left off thinking about Frederick, was now, between tea and dinner, thinking of him harder than ever. It has been funny and delightful, that little interlude of admiration, but of course it couldn't go on once Caroline appeared. Rose knew her place. She could see as well as anyone the unusually, the unique loveliness of Lady Caroline. How warm, though, things like admiration and appreciation made one feel. How capable of really deserving them. How different. How glowing. They seemed to quicken unsuspected faculties into life. She was sure she had been a thoroughly amusing woman between lunch and tea, and a pretty one, too. She was quite certain she had been pretty. She saw it in Mr. Briggs's eyes as clearly as in a looking glass. For a brief space, she thought, she had been like a torpid fly brought back to gay buzzing by the light of a fire in a wintry room. She still buzzed. She still tingled just at the remembrance. What fun it had been having an admirer, even for that little while. No wonder people liked admirers. They seemed, in some strange way, to make one come alive. Although it was over, she still glowed with it and felt more exhilarated, more optimistic, more as Lottie probably constantly felt, than she had done since she was a girl. She dressed with care, though she knew Mr. Briggs would no longer see her, but it gave her pleasure to see how pretty, while she was about it, she could make herself look, and very nearly she stuck a crimson camellia in her hair down by her ear. She did hold it there for a minute, and it looked almost sinfully attractive, and was exactly the color of her mouth. But she took it out again with a smile and a sigh, and put it in the proper place for flowers, which is water. She mustn't be silly, she thought. Think of the poor. Soon she would be back with them again, and what would a camellia behind her ear seem like then? Simply fantastic. But on one thing she was determined. The first thing she would do when she got home would be to have it out with Frederick. If he didn't come to San Salvatore, that is what she would do, the very first thing. Long ago she ought to have done this, but always she had been handicapped when she tried to by being so dreadfully fond of him and so much afraid that fresh wounds were going to be given her wretched soft heart. But now let him wound her as much as he chose, as much as he possibly could, she would still have it out with him. Not that he ever intentionally wounded her. She knew he never meant to. She knew he often had no idea of having done it. For a person who wrote books, thought Rose, Frederick didn't seem to have much imagination. Anyhow, she said to herself, getting up from the dressing table, things couldn't go on like this. She would have it out with him. This separate life, this freezing loneliness... She had had enough of it. Why shouldn't she, too, be happy? Why on earth, the energetic expression matched her mood of rebelliousness, shouldn't she, too, be loved and allowed to love? She looked at her little clock, still ten minutes before dinner. Tired of staying in her bedroom, she thought she would go on to Mrs. Fisher's battlements, which would be empty at this hour and watched the moon rise out of the sea. She went into the deserted upper hall with this intention, but was attracted on her way along it by the firelight shining through the open door of the drawing-room. How gay it looked! The fire transformed the room. A dark, ugly room in the daytime, it was transformed just as she had been transformed by the warmth of... No... She wouldn't be silly. She would think of the poor. 
the thought of them always brought her down to sobriety at once. She peeped in, firelight and flowers, and outside the deep slits of windows hung the blue curtain of the night. How pretty! What a sweet place San Salvatore was! And that gorgeous lilac on the table! She must go and put her face in it. But she never got to the lilac. She went one step towards it and then stood still, for she had seen the figure looking out of the window in the farthest corner, and it was Frederick. All the blood in Rose's body rushed to her heart and seemed to stop its beating. She stood quite still. He had not heard her. He did not turn round. She stood looking at him. The miracle had happened, and he had come. She stood holding her breath, so he needed her, for he had come instantly, so he too must have been thinking, longing. Her heart, which had seemed to stop beating, was suffocating her now, the way it raced along. Frederick did love her then. He must love her, or why had he come? Something, perhaps her absence, had made him turn to her, want her, and now the understanding she had made up her mind to have with him would be quite, would be quite easy. Her thoughts wouldn't go on. Her mind stammered. She couldn't think. She could only see and feel. She didn't know how it had happened. It was a miracle. God could do miracles. God had done this one. God could. God could, could. Her mind stammered again and broke off. Frederick, she tried to say, but no sound came, or if it did, the crackling of the fire covered it up. She must go nearer. She began to creep towards him, softly, softly. He did not move. He had not heard. She stole nearer and nearer, and the fire crackled, and he heard nothing. She stopped a moment, unable to breathe. She was afraid. Suppose he, suppose he, oh, but he had come, he had come. She went on again, close up to him, and her heart beat so loud that she thought he must hear it. And couldn't he feel, didn't he know? Frederick, she whispered, hardly able even to whisper, choked by the beating of her heart. He spun round on his heels. Rose, he exclaimed, staring blankly. But she did not see his stare, for her arms were round his neck and her cheek was against his, and she was murmuring, her lips on his ear, I knew you would come. In my very heart, I always, always knew you would come. End of chapter 20《Chapter Twenty One of the Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T. R. Love. Now, Frederick was not the man to hurt anything if he could help it. Besides, he was completely bewildered. Not only was his wife here, here of all places in the world, but she was clinging to him as she had not clung for years and murmuring love and welcoming him. If she welcomed him, she must have been expecting him. Strange as this was, it was the only thing in the situation which was evident, that and the softness of her cheek against his, and the long-forgotten sweet smell of her. Frederick was bewildered, but not being the man to hurt anything if he could help it, he too put his arms round her, and having put them round her, he also kissed her, and presently he was kissing her almost as tenderly as she was kissing him, and presently he was kissing her quite as tenderly, and again presently he was kissing her more tenderly, and just as if he had never left off. He was bewildered, but he could still kiss. It seemed curiously natural to be doing it, it made him feel as if he were thirty again instead of forty, and Rose were his Rose of twenty, 
the rose he had so much adored before she began to weigh what he did with her idea of right and the balance went against him and she had turned strange and stony and more and more shocked and oh so lamentable he couldn't get at her in those days at all she wouldn't she couldn't understand she kept on referring everything to what she called god's eyes in god's eyes it couldn't be right it wasn't right her miserable face whatever her principles did for her they didn't make her happy her little miserable face twisted with effort to be patient had been at last more than he could bear to see and he had kept away as much as he could she never ought to have been the daughter of a low church rector narrow devil she was quite unfitted to stand up against such an upbringing what had happened why she was here why she was his rose again passed his comprehension and meanwhile and until such time as he understood he could still kiss in fact he could not stop kissing and it was he now who began to murmur to say love things in her ear under the hair that smelt so sweet and tickled him just as he remembered it used to tickle him and as he held her close to his heart and her arms were soft round his neck he felt stealing over him a delicious sense of at first he didn't know what it was this delicate pervading warmth and then he recognized it as security yes security no need to be ashamed of his figure and to make jokes about it so as to forestall other people's and show he didn't mind it no need now to be ashamed of getting hot going up hills or to torment himself with pictures of how he probably appeared to beautiful young women how middle-aged how absurd in his inability to keep away from them rose cared nothing for such things with her he was safe to her he was her lover as he used to be and she would never notice or mind any of the ignoble changes that getting older had made in him and would go on making more and more frederick continued therefore with greater and greater warmth and growing delight to kiss his wife and the mere holding of her in his arms caused him to forget everything else how could he for instance remember or think of lady caroline to mention only one of the complications with which his situation bristled when here was his sweet wife miraculously restored to him whispering with her cheek against his in the dearest most romantic words how much she loved him how terribly she had missed him he did for one brief instant for even in moments of love there were brief instants of lucid thought recognized the immense power of the woman present and being actually held compared to that of the woman however beautiful who is somewhere else but that is as far as he got towards remembering scrap no farther she was like a dream fleeing before the morning light when did you start murmured rose her mouth on his ear she couldn't let him go not even to talk she couldn't let him go yesterday morning murmured frederick holding her close he couldn't let her go either oh the very instant then murmured rose this was cryptic but frederick said yes the very instant and kissed her neck how quickly my letter got to you murmured rose whose eyes were shut in the excess of her happiness didn't it said frederick who felt like shutting his eyes himself so there had been a letter soon no doubt light would be vouchsafed for him and meanwhile this was so strangely touchingly sweet this holding his rose to his heart again after all the years that he couldn't bother to try to guess anything oh he had been happy during those years because it was not in him to be unhappy besides how many interests life had had to offer him how many friends how much success how many women only too willing to help him to blot out the thought of the altered petrified 
pitiful little wife at home who wouldn't spend his money, who was appalled by his books, who drifted away and away from him, and always, if he tried to have it out with her, asked him with patient obstinacy what he thought the things he wrote and lived by looked in the eyes of God. No one, she said once, should ever write a book God wouldn't like to read. That is the test, Frederick. And he had laughed hysterically, burst into a great shriek of laughter, and rushed out of the house, away from her solemn little face, away from her pathetic, solemn little face. But this rose was his youth again, the best part of his life, the part of it that had had all the visions in it and all the hopes. How they had dreamed together, he and she, before he struck that vein of memoirs, how they had planned and laughed and loved. They had lived for a while in the very heart of poetry. After the happy days came the happy nights, the happy, happy nights, with her asleep close against his heart, with her when he woke up in the morning still close against his heart, for they hardly moved in their deep, happy sleep. It was wonderful to have it all come back to him at the touch of her, at the feel of her face against his, wonderful that she should be able to give him back his youth. Sweetheart, he murmured, overcome by remembrance, clinging to her now in his turn. Beloved husband, she breathed, the bliss of it, the sheer bliss. Briggs, coming in a few minutes before the gong went, on the chance that Lady Caroline might be there, was much astonished. He had supposed Rose Arbuthnot was a widow, and he still supposed it, so that he was much astonished. Well, I'm damned, thought Briggs, quite clearly and distinctly, for the shock of what he saw in the window startled him so much that for a moment he was shaken free of his own confused absorption. Aloud, he said, very red, Oh, I say, I beg your pardon, and then stood hesitating and wondering whether he oughtn't go back to his bedroom again. If he had said nothing, they would not have noticed he was there, but when he begged their pardon, Rose turned and looked at him as one who looks who is trying to remember, and Frederick looked at him too without at first quite seeing him. They didn't seem, thought Briggs, to mind or to be at all embarrassed. He couldn't be her brother. No brother ever brought that look into a woman's face. It was very awkward. If they didn't mind, he did. It upset him to come across his Madonna forgetting herself. Is this one of your friends? Frederick was able, after an instant, to ask Rose, who made no attempt to introduce the young man standing awkwardly in front of them, but continued to gaze at him with a kind of abstracted, radiant goodwill. It's Mr. Briggs, said Rose, recognizing him. This is my husband, she added. And Briggs, shaking hands, just had time to think how surprising it was to have a husband when you were a widow, before the gong sounded, and Lady Caroline would be there in a minute, and he ceased to be able to think at all, and merely became a thing with its eyes fixed on the door. Through the door immediately entered, in what seemed to him an endless procession, first Mrs. Fisher, very stately in her evening lace shawl and brooch, who, when she saw him, at once relaxed into smiles and benignity, only to stiffen, however, when she caught sight of the stranger. Then Mr. Wilkins, cleaner and neater and more carefully dressed and brushed than any man on earth, and then, tying something hurriedly as she came, Mrs. Wilkins, and then nobody. Lady Caroline was late. Where was she? Had she heard the gong? Oughtn't it to be beaten again? Suppose she didn't come to dinner after all. Briggs went cold. Introduce me, said Frederick on Mrs. Fisher's entrance, touching Rose's elbow. My husband, said Rose, holding him by the hand, her face exquisite. This, thought Mrs. Fisher, must now be the last of the husbands, unless Lady Caroline produces one from up her sleeve. But she received him graciously, 
for he certainly looked exactly like a husband, not at all like one of those people who go about abroad pretending they are husbands when they are not, and said she supposed he had come to accompany his wife home at the end of the month, and remarked that now the house would be completely full. So that, she added, smiling at Briggs, we shall at least really be getting our money's worth. Briggs grinned automatically, because he was just able to realize that somebody was being playful with him. But he had not heard her, and he did not look at her. Not only were his eyes fixed on the door, but his whole body was concentrated on it. Introduced in his turn, Mr. Wilkins was most hospitable, and called Frederick, Sir. Well, sir, said Mr. Wilkins heartily, here we are, here we are and having gripped his hand with an understanding that only wasn't mutual because Arbuthnot did not know yet what he was in for in the way of trouble, he looked at him, as a man should, squarely in the eyes, and allowed his look to convey, as plainly as a look can, that in him would be found staunchness, integrity, reliability, in fact, a friend in need. Mrs. Arbuthnot was very much flushed, Mr. Wilkins noticed. He had not seen her flushed like that before. Well, I'm their man, he thought. Lottie's greeting was effusive. It was done with both hands. Didn't I tell you? She laughed at Rose over her shoulder while Frederick was shaking her hands in both his. What did you tell her? asked Frederick in order to say something. The way they were all welcoming him was confusing. They had evidently all expected him, not only Rose. The sandy but agreeable young woman didn't answer his question, but looked extraordinarily pleased to see him. Why should she be extraordinarily pleased to see him? What a delightful place this is, said Frederick, confused and making the first remark that occurred to him. It's a tub of love, said the sandy young woman earnestly which confused him more than ever. And his confusion became excessive at the next words he heard, spoken, these by the old lady who said, We won't wait. Lady Caroline is always late. For he only then, on hearing her name, really and properly remembered Lady Caroline, and the thought of her confused him to excess. He went into the dining room like a man in a dream, he had come out to this place to see Lady Caroline, and had told her so. He had even told her in his fatuousness, it was true, but how fatuous, that he hadn't been able to help coming. She didn't know he was married. She thought his name was Arundel. Everybody in London thought his name was Arundel. He had used it and written under it so long that he almost thought it himself. In the short time since she had left him on the seat in the garden, where he told her he had come because he couldn't help it, he had found Rose again, had passionately embraced and been embraced, and had forgotten Lady Caroline. It would be an extraordinary piece of good fortune if Lady Caroline's being late meant she was tired or bored and would not come to dinner at all. Then he could... No, he couldn't. He turned a deeper red even than usual, he being a man of full habit and red anyhow, at the thought of such cowardice. No, he couldn't go away after dinner and catch his train and disappear to Rome. Not unless, that is, Rose came with him. But even so, what a running away. No, he couldn't. When they got to the dining room, Mrs. Fisher went to the head of the table. Was this Mrs. Fisher's house? he asked himself. He didn't know. He didn't know anything. And Rose, who in her earlier day of defying Mrs. Fisher, had taken the other end as her place. For, after all, no one could say by looking at a table which was its top and which its bottom, led Frederick to the seat next to her. If only, he thought, he could have been alone with Rose just five minutes more alone with Rose, so that he could have asked her, but probably he wouldn't have asked her anything, and only gone on kissing her. He looked round, 
the sandy young woman was telling the man they called Briggs to go and sit beside Mrs. Fisher. Was the house then the sandy young woman's and not Mrs. Fisher's? He didn't know. He didn't know anything. And as she herself sat down on Rosa's other side, so that she was opposite him, Frederick, and next to the genial man who had said, Here we are, and it was only too evident that there they were indeed. Next to Frederick, and between him and Briggs, was an empty chair, Lady Caroline's. No more than Lady Caroline knew of the presence in Frederick's life of Rose was Rose aware of the presence in Frederick's life of Lady Caroline. What would each think? He didn't know. He didn't know anything. Yes, he did know something, and that was that his wife had made it up with him, suddenly, miraculously, unaccountably, and divinely. Beyond that, he knew nothing. The situation was one with which he felt he could not cope. It must lead him whither it would. He could only drift. In silence, Frederick ate his soup, and the eyes, the large, expressive eyes of the young woman opposite, were on him, he could feel, with a growing look in them of inquiry. They were, he could see, very intelligent and attractive eyes, and full, apart from the inquiry, of good will. Probably she thought he ought to talk, but if she knew everything, she wouldn't think so. Briggs didn't talk either. Briggs seemed uneasy. What was the matter with Briggs? And Rose, too, didn't talk, but then that was natural. She never had been a talker. She had the loveliest expression on her face. How long would it be on it after Lady Caroline's entrance? He didn't know. He didn't know anything. But the genial man on Mrs. Fisher's left was talking enough for everybody. That fellow ought to have been a parson. Pulpits were the place for a voice like his. It would get him a bishopric in six months. He was explaining to Briggs, who shuffled about in his seat. Why did Briggs shuffle about in his seat? that he must have come out by the same train as Arbuthnot, and when Briggs, who said nothing, wriggled in apparent dissent, he undertook to prove it to him, and did prove it to him in long, clear sentences. "'Who's the man with the voice?' Frederick asked Rose in a whisper, and the young woman opposite, whose ears appeared to have the quickness of hearing of wild creatures, answered, "'He's my husband.' "'Then by all the rules?' said Frederick pleasantly, pulling himself together. You oughtn't to be sitting next to him. But I want to. I like sitting next to him. I didn't before I came here. Frederick could think of nothing to say to this, so he only smiled generally. It's this place, she said, nodding at him. It makes one understand. You've no idea what a lot you'll understand before you've done here. I'm sure I hope so, said Frederick, with real fervor. The soup was taken away, and the fish was brought. Briggs, on the other side of the empty chair, seemed more uneasy than ever. What was the matter with Briggs? Didn't he like fish? Frederick wondered what Briggs would do in the way of fidgets if he were in his own situation. Frederick kept on wiping his mustache and was not able to look up from his plate but that was as much as he showed of what he was feeling. Though he didn't look up, he felt the eyes of the young woman opposite raking him like searchlights, and Rose's eyes were on him too, he knew, but they rested on him unquestioningly, beautifully, like a benediction. How long would they go on doing that once Lady Caroline was there? He didn't know. He didn't know anything. He wiped his mustache for the twentieth unnecessary time and could not keep his hand steady, and the young woman opposite saw his hand not being quite steady, and her eyes raked him persistently. Why did her eyes rake him persistently? He didn't know. He didn't know anything. Then Briggs leapt to his feet. What was the matter with Briggs? Oh, yes, quite she had come. Frederick wiped his mustache and got up too. He was in for it now. Absurd, fantastic situation. 
Well, whatever happened, he could only drift, drift and look like an ass to Lady Caroline, the most absolute as well as deceitful ass, an ass who was also a reptile, for she might well think he had been mocking her out in the garden when he said, no doubt in a shaking voice, fool and ass, that he had come because he couldn't help it. While as for what he would look like to his rose when Lady Caroline introduced him to her, when Lady Caroline introduced him as her friend whom she had invited in to dinner, well, God alone knew that. He therefore, as he got up, wiped his mustache for the last time before the catastrophe. But he was reckoning without scrap. That accomplished and experienced young woman slipped into the chair Briggs was holding for her, and on Lottie's leaning across eagerly and saying before anyone else could get a word in, Just fancy, Caroline, how quickly Rose's husband has got here, turned to him without so much as the faintest shadow of surprise on her face, and held out her hand, and smiled like a young angel, and said, And me late your very first evening. The Daughter of the Droit Witches End of Chapter 21「Chapter Twenty Two of the Enchanted April by Elizabeth von Arnhem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by T. R. Love. That evening was the evening of the full moon. The garden was an enchanted place where all the flowers seemed white. The lilies, the daphnes, the orange blossom, the white stocks, the white pinks, the white roses. You could see these as plainly as in the daytime, but the colored flowers existed only as fragrance. The three younger women sat on the low wall at the end of the top garden after dinner, rose a little apart from the others, and watched the enormous moon moving slowly over the place where Shelley had lived his last months, just on a hundred years before. The sea quivered along the path of the moon, the stars winked and trembled. The mountains were misty blue outlines with little clusters of lights shining through from little clusters of homes. In the garden, the plants stood quite still, straight and unstirred by the smallest ruffle of air. Through the glass doors, the dining room, with its candlelit table and brilliant flowers, nasturtiums and marigolds that night, glowed like some magic cave of color and the three men smoking round it looked strangely animated figures seen from the silence, the huge, cool calm of outside. Mrs. Fisher had gone to the drawing-room and the fire. Scrap and Lottie, their faces upturned to the sky, said very little and in whispers. Rose said nothing. Her face, too, was upturned. She was looking at the umbrella pine, which had been smitten into something glorious, silhouetted against stars. Every now and then Scrap's eyes lingered on Rose, so did Lottie's, for Rose was lovely. Anywhere at that moment, among all the well-known beauties, she would have been lovely. Nobody could have put her in the shade, blown out her light that evening. She was too evidently shining. Lottie bent close to Scrap's ear and whispered, Love, she whispered. Scrap nodded. Yes, she said under her breath. She was obliged to admit it. You only had to look at Rose to know that here was love. There's nothing like it, whispered Lottie. Scrap was silent. It's a great thing, whispered Lottie after a pause, during which they both watched Rose's upturned face. To get on with one's loving? Perhaps you can tell me of anything else in the world that works such wonders. But Scrap couldn't tell her, and if she could have, what a night to begin arguing in. This was a night for... She pulled herself up. Love again. It was everywhere. There was no getting away from it. She had come to this place to get away from it, and here was everybody in its different stages. 
Even Mrs. Fisher seemed to have been brushed by one of the many feathers of love's wing, and at dinner was different, full of concern because Mr. Briggs wouldn't eat, and her face when she turned to him, all soft with motherliness. Scrap looked up at the pine tree, motionless among stars. Beauty made you love, and love made you beautiful. She pulled her wrap closer round her with a gesture of defense, of keeping out and off. She didn't want to grow sentimental. Difficult not to, here. The marvelous night stole in through all one's chinks and brought in with it, whether one wanted them or not, enormous feelings, feelings one couldn't manage. Great things about death and time and waste glorious and devastating things, magnificent and bleak, at once rapture and terror, an immense heart-cleaving longing. She felt small and dreadfully alone. She felt uncovered and defenseless. Instinctively, she pulled her wrap closer. With this thing of chiffon, she tried to protect herself from the eternities. I suppose, whispered Lottie, Rose's husband seems to you just an ordinary, good-natured, middle-aged man. Scrap brought her gaze down from the stars and looked at Lottie a moment while she focused her mind again. Just a rather red, rather round man, whispered Lottie. Scrap bowed her head. He isn't, whispered Lottie. Rose sees through all that. That's mere trimmings. She sees what we can't see because she loves him. Always love. Scrap got up and, winding herself very tightly in her wrap, moved away to her day corner and sat down there alone on the wall and looked out across the other sea, the sea where the sun had gone down, the sea with the faraway dim shadow stretching into it, which was France. Yes, love worked wonders, and Mr. Arundel, she couldn't at once get used to his other name, was to Rose love itself. But it also worked inverted wonders. It didn't invariably, as she well knew, transfigure people into saints and angels. Grievously, indeed, did it sometimes do the opposite. She had had it in her life applied to her to access. If it had let her alone... If it had at least been moderate and infrequent, she might, she thought, have turned out a quite decent, generous-minded, kindly human being. And what was she, thanks to this love Lottie talked so much about? Scrap searched for a just description. She was a spoiled, a sour, a suspicious, and a selfish spinster. The glass doors of the dining room opened, and the three men came out into the garden, Mr. Wilkins's voice flowing along in front of them. He appeared to be doing all the talking. The other two were saying nothing. Perhaps she had better go back to Lottie and Rose. It would be tiresome to be discovered and hemmed into the cul-de-sac by Mr. Briggs. She got up reluctantly for she considered it unpardonable of Mr. Briggs to force her to move about like this, to force her out of any place she wished to sit in, and she emerged from the Daphne bushes, feeling like some gaunt, stern figure of just resentment, and wishing that she looked as gaunt and stern as she felt, so would she have struck repugnance into the soul of Mr. Briggs, and been free of him. But she knew she didn't look like that, however hard she might try. At dinner, his hand shook when he drank, and he couldn't speak to her without flushing scarlet and then going pale. And Mrs. Fisher's eyes had sought hers with the entreaty of one who asked that her only son may not be hurt. How could a human being, thought Scrap, frowning as she issued forth from her corner, how could a man made in God's image behave so, and be fitted for better things she was sure, with his youth, his attractiveness, and his brains? He had brains. She had examined him cautiously whenever at dinner Mrs. Fisher forced him to turn away to answer her, and she was sure he had brains. Also, he had character, 
There was something noble about his head, about the shape of his forehead, noble and kind. All the more deplorable that he should allow himself to be infatuated by a mere outside and waste any of his strength, any of his peace of mind, hanging round just a woman thing. If only he could see right through her, see through all her skin and stuff, he would be cured, and she might go on sitting undisturbed on this wonderful night by herself. Just beyond the daphne bushes, she met Frederick, hurrying. I was determined to find you first, he said, before I go to Rose. And he added quickly, I want to kiss your shoes. Do you? said Scrat, smiling. Then I must go and put on my new ones. These aren't nearly good enough. She felt immensely well disposed towards Frederick. He, at least, would grab no more. His grabbing days, so sudden and so brief, were done. Nice man, agreeable man. She now definitely liked him. Clearly he had been going into some sort of a tangle, and she was grateful to Lottie for stopping her in time at dinner from saying something hopelessly complicating. But whatever he had been getting into, he was out of it now. His face and Rose's face had the same light in them. I shall adore you forever now, said Frederick. Scrap smiled. Shall you? she said. I adored you before because of your beauty. Now I adore you because you're not only as beautiful as a dream, but as decent as a man. When the impetuous young woman, Frederick went on, the blessedly impetuous young woman blurted out in the nick of time that I am Rose's husband, you behaved exactly as a man would have behaved to his friend. Did I? said Scrap, her enchanting dimple very evident. It's the rarest, most precious of combinations, said Frederick, to be a woman and have the loyalty of a man. Is it? smiled Scrap, a little wistfully. These were indeed handsome compliments, if only she were really like that. And I want to kiss your shoes. Won't this save trouble? she asked, holding out her hand. He took it and swiftly kissed it and was hurrying away again. Bless you, he said as he went. Where is your luggage? Scrap called after him. Oh, Lord, yes, said Frederick, pausing. It's at the station. I'll send for it. He disappeared through the bushes. She went indoors to give the order. And this is how it happened that Domenico, for the second time that evening, found himself journeying into Masago and wandering as he went. Then, having made the necessary arrangements for the perfect happiness of these two people, she came slowly out into the garden again, very much absorbed in thought. Love seemed to bring happiness to everybody but herself. It had certainly got hold of everybody there in its different varieties, except herself. Poor Mr. Briggs had been got hold of by its least dignified variety. Poor Mr. Briggs! He was a disturbing problem, and his going away next day wouldn't, she was afraid, solve him. When she reached the others, Mr. Arundel, she kept on forgetting that he wasn't Mr. Arundel, was already, his arm through roses, going off with her, probably to the greater seclusion of the lower garden. No doubt they had a great deal to say to each other. Something had gone wrong between them, and had suddenly been put right. San Salvatore, Lottie would say, San Salvatore working its spell of happiness. She could quite believe in its spell. Even she was happier here than she had been for ages and ages. The only person who would go empty away would be Mr. Briggs. Poor Mr. Briggs. When she came inside of the group, he looked much too nice and boyish not to be happy. It seemed out of the picture that the owner of the place, the person to whom they owed all this, should be the only one to go away from it unblessed. Compunction seized Scrap. What very pleasant days she had spent in his house, lying in his garden, enjoying his flowers, loving his views, 
using his things, being comfortable, being rested, recovering, in fact. She had had the most leisured, peaceful, and thoughtful time of her life, and all really thanks to him. Oh, she knew she paid him some ridiculous small sum a week, out of all proportion to the benefits she got in exchange, but what was that in the balance? And wasn't it entirely thanks to him that she had come across Lottie? Never else would she and Lottie have met. Never else would she have known her. Compunction laid its quick warm hand on Scrap. Impulsive gratitude flooded her. She went straight up to Briggs. I owe you so much, she said, overcome by the sudden realization of all she did owe him and ashamed of her churlishness in the afternoon and at dinner. Of course, he hadn't known she was being churlish. Of course, her disagreeable inside was camouflaged as usual by the chance arrangement of her outside, but she knew it. She was churlish. She had been churlish to everybody for years. Any penetrating eye, thought Scrap, any really penetrating eye would see her for what she was, a spoilt, a sour, a suspicious, and a selfish spinster. I owe you so much, therefore said Scrap earnestly, walking straight up to Briggs, humbled by these thoughts. He looked at her in wonder. You owe me, he said. But it's I who, I who, he stammered. To see her there in his garden, nothing in it, no white flower, was whiter, more exquisite. Please, said Scrap, still more earnestly, won't you clear your mind of everything except just truth? You don't owe me anything. How should you? I don't owe you anything? echoed Briggs. Why, I owe you my first sight of, of, oh, for goodness sake, for goodness sake, said Scrap entreatingly. Do please be ordinary. Don't be humble. Why should you be humble? It's ridiculous of you to be humble. You're worth fifty of me. Unwise, thought Mr. Wilkins, who was standing there too, while Lottie sat on the wall. He was surprised, he was concerned, he was shocked that Lady Caroline should thus encourage Briggs. Unwise, very, thought Mr. Wilkins, shaking his head. Briggs's condition was so bad already that the only course to take with him was to repel him utterly, Mr. Wilkins considered. No half measures were the least use with Briggs and kindliness and familiar talk would only be misunderstood by the unhappy youth. The daughter of the droit witches could not really, it was impossible to suppose it, desire to encourage him. Briggs was all very well, but Briggs was Briggs. His name alone proved that. Probably Lady Caroline did not quite appreciate the effect of her voice and face and how between them they made otherwise ordinary words seem, well, encouraging. But these words were not quite ordinary. She had not, he feared, sufficiently pondered them. Indeed, and indeed, she needed an adviser, some sagacious, subjective counsellor like himself. There she was, standing before Briggs, almost holding out her hand to him. Briggs, of course, ought to be thanked, for they were having the most delightful holiday in his house, but not thanked to excess, and not by Lady Caroline alone. That very evening he had been considering the presentation to him next day of a round robin of collective gratitude on his departure, but he should not be thanked like this, in the moonlight, in the garden, by the lady he was so manifestly infatuated with? Mr. Wilkins, therefore, desiring to assist Lady Caroline out of this situation by swiftly applied tact, said with much heartiness, It is most proper, Briggs, that you should be thanked. You will please allow me to add my expressions of indebtedness and those of my wife to Lady Caroline's. We ought to have proposed a vote of thanks to you at dinner, 
you should have been toasted. There certainly ought to have been some, but Briggs took no notice of him whatever. He simply continued to look at Lady Caroline as though she were the first woman he had ever seen. Neither, Mr. Wilkins observed, did Lady Caroline take any notice of him. She, too, continued to look at Briggs, and with that odd air of almost appeal. Most unwise, most. Lottie, on the other hand, took too much notice of him, choosing this moment when Lady Caroline needed special support and protection to get up off the wall and put her arm through his and draw him away. I want to tell you something, Mellersh, said Lottie at this juncture, getting up. Presently, said Mr. Wilkins, waving her aside. No, now, said Lottie, and she drew him away. He went with extreme reluctance. Briggs should be given no rope at all, not an inch. Well, what is it? he asked it patiently as she led him towards the house. Lady Caroline ought not to be left like that, exposed to annoyance. Oh, but she isn't, Lottie assured him, just as if he had said this aloud, which he certainly had not. Caroline is perfectly all right. Not at all all right. That young Briggs is... Of course he is. What did you expect? Let's go indoors to the fire and Mrs. Fisher. She's all by herself. I cannot, said Mr. Wilkins, trying to draw back. Leave Lady Caroline alone in the garden. Don't be silly, Mellersh. She isn't alone. Besides, I want to tell you something. Well, tell me then. Indoors. With reluctance that increased at every step, Mr. Wilkins was taken farther and farther away from Lady Caroline. He believed in his wife now and trusted her, but on this occasion he thought she was making a terrible mistake. In the drawing room sat Mrs. Fisher by the fire, and it certainly was to Mr. Wilkins, who preferred rooms and fires after dark to gardens and moonlight, more agreeable to be in there than out of doors, if he could have brought Lady Caroline safely in with him. As it was, he went in with extreme reluctance. Mrs. Fisher, her hands folded on her lap, was doing nothing, merely gazing fixedly into the fire. The lamp was arranged conveniently for reading, but she was not reading. Her great dead friends did not seem worth reading that night. They always said the same things now. Over and over again they said the same things, and nothing new was to be got out of them any more forever. No doubt they were greater than anyone was now, but they had this immense disadvantage that they were dead. Nothing further was to be expected of them, while of the living, what might one not still expect? She craved for the living, the developing, the crystallized and finished wearied her. She was thinking that if only she had had a son, a son like Mr. Briggs, a boy like that, going on, unfolding, alive, affectionate, taking care of her and loving her. The look on her face gave Mrs. Wilkins's heart a little twist when she saw it. Poor old dear, she thought, all the loneliness of age flashing upon her, the loneliness of having outstayed one's welcome in the world, of being in it only on sufferance, the complete loneliness of the old childless woman who has failed to make friends. It did seem that people could only be really happy in pairs, any sorts of pairs, not in the least necessarily lovers, but pairs of friends, pairs of mothers and children, of brothers and sisters, and where was the other half of Mrs. Fisher's pair going to be found? Mrs. Wilkins thought she had perhaps better kiss her again. The kissing this afternoon had been a great success. She knew it. She had instantly felt Mrs. Fisher's reaction to it. So she crossed over and bent down and kissed her and said cheerfully, We've come in, which indeed was evident. 
This time, Mrs. Fisher actually put up her hand and held Mrs. Wilkins's cheek against her own. This living thing, full of affection, of warm, racing blood. And as she did this, she felt safe with the strange creature, sure that she, who herself did unusual things so naturally, would take the action quite as a matter of course, and not embarrass her by being surprised. Mrs. Wilkins was not at all surprised. She was delighted. I believe I'm the other half of her pair, flashed into her mind. I believe it's me, positively me, going to be fast friends with Mrs. Fisher. Her face, when she lifted her head, was full of laughter, too extraordinary the developments produced by San Salvatore. She and Mrs. Fisher, but she saw them being fast friends. Where are the others? asked Mrs. Fisher. Thank you, dear, she added, as Mrs. Wilkins put a footstool under her feet, a footstool obviously needed, Mrs. Fisher's legs being short. I see myself throughout the years, thought Mrs. Wilkins, her eyes dancing, bringing footstools to Mrs. Fisher. The roses, she said, straightening herself, have gone into the lower garden. I think love-making. The roses? The Fredericks, then, if you like. They're completely merged and indistinguishable. Why not say the Arbuthnots, my dear, said Mr. Wilkins. Very well, Melhurst, the Arbuthnots, and the Carolines. Both Mr. Wilkins and Mrs. Fisher started. Mr. Wilkins, usually in such complete control of himself, started even more than Mrs. Fisher, and for the first time since his arrival, felt angry with his wife. Really, he began indignantly. Very well, Melhurst, the Briggses, then. The Briggses, cried Mr. Wilkins, now very angry indeed, for the implication to him was a most outrageous insult to the entire race of Desters, dead Desters, living Desters, and Desters still harmless because they were yet unborn. Really? I'm sorry, Melersh, said Mrs. Wilkins, pretending meekness, if you don't like it. Like it? You've taken leave of your senses. Why, they've never set eyes on each other before today. That's true, but that's why they're able now to go ahead. Go ahead? Mr. Wilkins could only echo the outrageous words. I'm sorry, Melersh, said Mrs. Wilkins again, if you don't like it, but... Her gray eyes shone, and her face rippled with the light and conviction that had so much surprised Rose the first time they met. It's useless minding, she said. I shouldn't struggle if I were you, because, she stopped and looked first at one alarmed solemn face and then at the other, and laughter as well as light flickered and danced over her. I see them being the Briggses, finished Mrs. Wilkins. That last week the syringa came out at San Salvatore, and all the acacias flowered. No one had noticed how many acacias there were, till one day the garden was full of a new scent, and there were the delicate trees, the lovely successors to the wisteria, hung all over among their trembling leaves with blossom. To lie under an acacia tree that last week, and look up through the branches at its frail leaves on white flowers quivering against the blue of the sky, while the least movement of the air shook down their scent, was a great happiness. Indeed, the whole garden dressed itself gradually towards the end in white, and grew more and more scented. There were the lilies as vigorous as ever, and the white stalks, and white pinks, and white banksy roses, and the syringa, and the jessamine, and at last the crowning fragrance of the acacias. When, on the first of May, everybody went away, even after they had got to the bottom of the hill and passed through the iron gates out into the village, they could still smell the acacias. End of chapter 22
End of the Enchanted April by Elizabeth Vaughn Arnhem